I stood in front of my grandpa's cabin, the keys to the front door in hand, and the engine of my truck rumbling gently behind me. The sun raced towards the ground, throwing its final rays of light over the forest. I came here to escape the madness of everyday life, to unwind and let my mind cool off for a month. Working as a game dev during the pandemic did a number on my mental health, and I needed to recharge my batteries before plunging back in. Too many impossible deadlines, too much crunch to finish a terrible product, too much isolation. They eroded my sanity until I couldn't take it anymore. I reached the front door and tried the keys one by one. Turned out it was the last I tried, because of course it would be that one. The door swung aside with creaks of its rusty hinges, opening up the cabin's insides to the world for the first time in over two years. I stepped in, slow and careful, shining the light of my phone around to see. A thick layer of dust covered everything, denoting the property's descent into disuse since my grandpa's passing. None of his sons or grandkids cared enough to come and check on it, so it fell into disrepair. No one had even wanted it when the will was read out, so it was passed around until it ended up with me. And truth be told, I didn't care much for it either. We were all city dwellers living in New York, so no one was keen to inherit a dingy cabin out in the wilderness of Ohio. Still, with the arrival of this blasted pandemic, I was happy to have signed those papers. I spent a few minutes familiarising myself with the cabin again. It had been more than a decade since the last time I came out here with my grandpa. He had expanded the structure since then, adding a guest room and an actual kitchen. First things first, I went up into the attic to turn on the generator. Since it hadn't been used in so long, it needed a bit of maintenance before it started up. I replaced the coolant and oil, installed new filters, and I even replaced the spark plugs. The batteries and belt drives looked fine, so I let them be. Last thing to do was refuel it, and voila, I had electricity. With the lights in the cabin coming on, I checked the fridge and the pantry, cleaning them of all cans before restocking them with my own. I finished ferrying my supplies inside from the truck, I ate a can of something for dinner, and I went to bed for the night. The next day, I had my work cut out for me cleaning the cabin. When I was done with the inside, I went around it to the shed out in the back. I found the place cluttered with various tools and knickknacks, but the centerpiece was what immediately got my attention. Rusting away in the middle of the shed, surrounded by worthless junk on all sides, was my grandpa's old four-wheeler. A bulky two-seater ATV with a cage around it that made it look like a dune buggy. I felt like a kid on Christmas morning, eager to get my hands on my present. Figuring the keys had to be somewhere in the shed, I left more cares behind me in my search of them, but I found them in a nearby drawer and I gave the four-wheeler's engine a tentative test. It didn't turn on, of course, but I expected that. Much like I did with the generator, I ran some maintenance on it, though it took me much longer to get it running. Luckily, it wasn't anything major. The battery was drained. With my new vehicle, my vacation got a thousand times better. Even though I had my truck with me, it was ill-fitted to brave the unsteady terrain of the forest. I spent that day and the next cleaning out the shed as well, throwing away the junk and doing an inventory of what I wanted to keep. And let me tell you, that shed was the gift that kept on giving. Besides a ton of useful tools, I found a couple of fishing poles with sets of lures and floats, all in very good condition, as well as an old-timey compound bow with ten arrows. As soon as I was done with cleaning, I hopped on the four-wheeler and made my way to the nearby lake to catch some fish and end my vegetarian streak. Calling it a lake is, well, a bit generous on my part. It's more of a pond than anything else, an area where the river overflows into a meadow at the edge of my property. The shores are muddy and infested with reeds, the water is shallow throughout, but there's fish to be caught. I found a nice patch of grass under a tree, so I cast out the line and waited. It took a while to get a bite, and I almost missed it. I jumped on the fishing rod and started reeling the fish in. When it was finally out of the water and into my hands, 
I admired my catch before throwing it into a bucket I brought along. I applied new bait to the hook and cast the line again, but as I went to lie down, something caught my eye. On the other side of the pond, hidden in the thick shadows of the forest, I saw a deer. It stared directly at me, unmoving, and I could feel its eyes scale me up. As soon as I moved though, it bolted away, so I didn't think much of it. I was in the middle of the wilderness. Seeing animals was a given. I ended up catching a few fish about the size of my palm. After I discarded them and threw them on the grill along with some veggies, I made for a tasty meal. Having finally eaten some meat, my mood improved exponentially. I decided to try out the bow, doing a quick and dirty job of painting a target on a nearby tree. I, of course, missed all of the arrows that I launched at it, but it was a lot of fun. The next few days were spent in a similar manner, and I slowly fell into a routine. Go fishing in the morning, batch up the cabin after lunch, and either drive the four-wheeler around or practice my aim with a bow in the evenings. It took me a while, but at the end of the second day, I was hitting the tree more often than not, and by the end of the third, I started landing arrows inside of the target. The cabin itself didn't need as much work as I thought it would. My grandpa built it out of treated logs, so it was pretty sturdy and it didn't show signs of rot. The roof was ceramic shingles, so besides checking if they shifted about, I didn't need to do much else. By the time my first proper weekend there rolled around, I decided to give hunting small prey a try. Fish are nice and all, but they can't compare to proper meat. I got out Saturday morning, I hunted with my bow and some bait in the form of chopped veggies and trekked on foot to the edge of the property. Seeing as I rode around on a four-wheeler a lot, most animals got scared away around the cabin. I found some bushes at the edge of a clearing and if my math wasn't failing me, I was still well within my property. I threw the bait around and hungered down waiting for some small critter or another to come take a bite. The only thing I forgot to account for was how boring the wait turned out to be. Laid on my belly in the bushes, I nearly fell asleep a couple of times. I don't know how long I waited until I got my first signs of prey, but I heard something approach me. The bow came up in my hands and I notched an arrow, ready to pull it back and let it fly at a moment's notice. But when I caught sight of the animal, I relaxed. The silhouette of a deer scampered around in the forest in front of me, taking tentative steps in my direction, but I wasn't equipped to take it down. If it got too close and would eat my bait, I'd simply scare it away and wait for something else. But it never did, instead stopping at the edge of the clearing and looking straight at me. I knew I was too well hidden to be seen so easily, but then again, Animals have better eyesight and smell than me. It watched me for a few minutes, and, in turn, I admired its majesty. I'd never seen a live deer so close up to that point, but even so, I was sure that this particular one was much more beautiful than the average buck. Then, as soon as it came, the buck turned and ran away. I was a bit bummed out, but I didn't dwell on it for long. Only minutes later, my prey of choice appeared as well. A plump rabbit came out of the underbrush, hopping around the clearing until he found a piece of carrot. It grabbed the bait with his front paws, rising up on its hind legs to keep on the lookout while it munched away. Sadly for it, the position it chose left it facing away from me. I drew the arrow back, held my breath to steady my aim and let it fly at the unsuspecting animal. But I missed and the arrow ended up glancing the rabbit's ear. It let out a shriek and bolted, squirting blood everywhere in its frantic run for safety. I jolted up from the ground to follow it, feeling that annoying sensation of static spreading my legs. The rabbit was small and fast, but I kept up with it, even if just barely. We ran through the forest in more or less a straight line, swerving between trees and dodging prickly underbrush. I was sure that I'd leave my property at this rate, so I got another arrow out of the quiver and I slowed down as I notched it. With only a fraction of a second left to aim, I let the arrow fly. The rabbit almost dodged it, but it changed direction at the last moment 
and the arrow hit it in the nape. It fell over, dead, keeping up the running motion as his body was ravaged by spasms. I took a deep sigh of relief, putting the bow away before I walked over to the rabbit to pick it up. As I reached it and leaned down, a voice resounding through the forest stopped me. You're trespassing on my private property, the voice yelled. No sudden moves or I'll shoot. I got up slowly, raising my hands up in the air as I looked around. The forest distorted the sound, making it echo off the trees, so I couldn't pinpoint its exact location. But I could tell that it was a man, mid-fifties to early sixties by his tone and demeanour. I didn't mean to, I answered, feeling my pulse rising. It was an accident. I chased a rabbit and left my own property. Your property? The man asked, stepping out in the open. He was some fifty feet away, dressed in camo clothes and shouldering a mean-looking rifle. Are you one of Barry's sons? He asked. One of his grandsons, I answered, recognizing my grandpa's name. My name's Isaac. You should have said so sooner, Sonny, the man said, putting the rifle away and walking towards me. Nearly shot you there. Barry would have killed me for that. He laughed at that, setting me at ease. I put my hands down and waited for him to reach me, observing him better as he approached. Turns out, I was not only right in my earlier assessment, but I was generous with a few years. He looked like he was in his mid-sixties, with a tall frame, wide shoulders, and a gaunt face drowned out by white stubble. He was missing his left ear, part of his lower lip, and the tip of his nose and his left cheek ran rampant with scars. His appearance was scary, I won't lie, especially given the circumstances of our meeting, but his beaming smile helped. I doubt that Grandpa can do that anymore, I said. So, you kicked the bucket, huh? The man asked. I nodded my head in answer. I figured that was the case when he stopped coming out here. We were hunting buddies. Name's Huck, he said, extending me his hand for a shake. All of Barry's family is welcome on my land. Sorry again. No problem, I said, trying to sound reassuring. It's not like you could have known. Huck looked down at the rabbit, then back up at me. His brows furrowed, and his amusement died down as suddenly as it had appeared. Did you kill anything else out here? He asked with a deep sense of worry and urgency. Have you been here for long? A week, I answered, and I caught some fish but nothing else other than that. Huck's tense posture deflated when he heard that, and his shoulders slouched as he took a deep inhale. His reaction had me curious, but I didn't go prime about it. Good, he said. The fish are free. Yansa doesn't mind those. Yansa? I asked. Who's that? Some ranger? I thought I could hunt without a permit on private land here. Yansa is... Hug started, but his words stopped in his throat. He took a hand to his nape, rubbing it over his grey hair in long streaks. Yansa is the forest, the spirit of it. That's the best way I can put it, but it ain't quite right. I couldn't help but show my utter lack of belief at the mention of Mumbo Jumbo, and Hug noticed. He got defensive, and his attitude shifted from worry to annoyance. I know it sounds crazy he said, taking a finger to his face and dragging it over one of the longest scars he had, one that ran from the remnants of his left ear all the way down his jaw, stopping just shy of his neck. But I have the scars to prove it. Going against Yanza's wishes is a terrible idea. Fine, I said, relenting all of the sarcasm that I had in store. The fish are free. What else? I'm guessing the rabbit isn't. The fish are free. Everything else is a gift that Yansa wants you to have, Huck explained. You set out this morning to hunt a rabbit. Yansa brought you a rabbit. Simple as. Know what you want to hunt, come prepared with the right tools, and Yansa will provide. But only kill what Yansa allows you to. Nothing else. Okay, I half said, half asked. Anything else? Don't cause suffering. Be swift with your kill. All of the animals are Yansa's children, and it doesn't appreciate that. Once you start a hunt, you have to end it. Yansa doesn't like its gifts being wasted. Same with using the carcass. Make the most of it. And only the animal's flesh is yours. You have to return the spirit to Yansa. 
This all sounded like a bunch of new age hippie BS, but I could at least appreciate the underlying message. Be kind, be thankful, everything in nature is part of a big unity, all of that soul warming stuff. Even though I didn't buy it, I could at least sympathise with Hug's intentions, so I humoured him. And how can I do that? I asked. Cut out the animal's heart where it fell, and bearing it while saying a short prayer. The words don't matter. The answer appreciates the intent more than the prayer itself. Fine, let's give it a try, I said, wishing to just get it over with already. Do you happen to have a knife? I didn't pack one. Huck pulled out a hunting knife from a sheath in his clothes, handing it to me and kneeling alongside me. I did a small incision, pulled out the rabbit's heart, and buried it while mumbling a thank you for your sacrifice. Huck seemed pleased by it, so I slung the rabbit over my shoulder and got up to walk back to my cabin. Wanna come over for a beer at my place? He asked before I got to take a single step. It's not too far away, and I want to ask you more about Barry, if you don't mind. I really miss my hunting buddy. I paused for a moment, thinking it over. Huck had a few quirks and strange beliefs, but then again, who doesn't? He didn't seem like a bad person or unstable by any means, so I stood to lose nothing, but I could gain a friend and a cold beer. Sure thing, we'll need the way, I answered. So Huck did just that taking off through the forest with me on his heels. We walked through the underbrush, under the sun's intense midsummer heat, with him bombarding me with questions about my grandpa. By the looks of it, Huck wasn't lying. He knew grandpa, and he knew him well, but it was clear that they hadn't seen each other in quite some time, even before grandpa's passing. Anyway, true to his word, Huck's cabin was only 15 minutes away. It was a bit smaller than grandpa's, but it looked just as homely. We took to its shade when we reached it, and Huck showed me to a porch swing before going inside to get the promised beer. I peered in through the open door, seeing that the cabin was full of pelts, trophies, and various trinkets made from animal parts. It gave off a very arts and crafts air, certainly not what I expected from the impression that Huck gave me. I took the seat he offered me before he returned, and he found me swinging back and forth, feet in the air like a little kid. Huck brought out a cooler filled with ice and bottles, and he retrieved two beers from it before he joined me. Slow down, he urged. I'll throw up. I did as he asked, taking the beer from him and opening it. Cheers, he said, raising his up in the air for a toast. For new neighbours, I said with a chuckle. We spent a while talking about this or that, mostly small stuff. Huck asked me about myself and what I did for a living, trying to get to know me better. When I told him that I was a programmer making video games, he was very impressed, and his reaction made me laugh a little. Takes a lot of brains for a job like that, he said defensively. More than I got. We talked some more as we finished beer after beer, and the subject of my grandpa soon returned. I told Huck what happened, that he died peacefully in his sleep from a heart attack, and then I started asking questions of my own. So you and Grandpa haven't met in a long time, right? I asked. Barry, you stopped joining me for hunts a while back, Huck answered. Stop visiting me too. We had a falling out, but I never stopped considering him a friend. Why? What happened? I asked. I never spent as much time with my Grandpa as I could have. We mostly saw each other during holidays and family gatherings, so... He didn't get to tell me about many things going on in his life. Huck is one of those things. I never even knew that the man existed. Now, he offered me a window back in time, a perspective of Grandpa that no one else had, and I decided to take advantage of that. We went hunting, Huck said, his tone quieter than before. We were hoping for a boar, to get some decent meat, you know. I nodded my head, so he continued. Well, we found a buck instead, a damn gorgeous one with the most beautiful antlers I've ever seen. And Barry, he knew about the answer too. He knew that we weren't supposed to hunt it. We came out for boars, not deer. But he said that he had to have that buck. We argued over it, and when it became clear that Barry wouldn't back down, I... 
I shot the buck myself. He made a motion of bringing up a gun and aiming it, putting on a pained expression when he pulled the imaginary trigger. Buckshot, Hug said in a grey voice. But I was too far away. I clipped the buck's face, but it didn't bring it down. Blew off its left ear, lower lip, and mangled the left side of its snout. He took a hand to his own face, tracing his fingers along the scars that he wore, and I realised the implications. It ran away, and we couldn't find it again, and Yansa made sure to pay me back for doing what I did. I winced, hearing Huck's story, but I didn't interrupt him with questions. I was fine with whatever details he wanted to share. I didn't want to ask him for more when I saw the pain that the memories brought him. Me and Barry, we... We argued, threw names and accusations around, and the words hurt, you know. Barry left in a fit and told me he didn't want to see me ever again, and he stuck to his word. I'm sorry, I said. Yeah, me too, Hug said. I'm glad that I pulled the trigger first, and the answer came for me. I'm glad that I took that pain for my friend. I'm just... I don't know. I wish Barry had found out and appreciated it, you know. I wish we were still friends. The conversation slowed down after that, and it was abundantly clear that I caused it with my questions. I finished the third beer and wanted to get up, but Hug stopped me. Let me take care of that for you, he said, pointing at the rabbit. The meat might go bad before you get home. Yansa won't appreciate that. I didn't want to accept, but then I thought it over. I didn't know the first thing about skinning and gutting an animal, so this was the perfect opportunity for me to learn. Huck went inside and returned with a chopping board, as well as an assortment of tools for the job. His hands were nimble as he worked, and his skills were a dead giveaway of his experience. Before I got to finish another beer, he skinned, gutted and portioned the rabbit expertly. He sealed the meat in bags, which he handed over to me, and he went a little ways away from the cabin to throw away the guts and whatever else couldn't be used. They'll make fine dining for some critter or another, he said when he returned. It's as good a way as any to return them to Yansa. I flinched at hearing their name mentioned once again. It started getting on my nerves, but I bit my tongue and kept my sarcastic replies to myself. Huck also wanted to give me the rabbit's pelt, but I told him to keep it as a gift, since I didn't know how to treat it anyway. Here, he offered when I took off on foot. I'll take you home. It's getting late, and the forest isn't safe at night. No, it's fine. I tried to refuse, but Hook really isn't the type to take no for an answer. Nonsense, he said, and rushed behind his cabin. In a few moments, the sound of an engine coming to life rumbled through the clearing. Hook returned on a four-wheeler, much like my own, with only a different paint job to tell it apart. I hopped on and he drove me to my cabin, going slowly and cautiously. We were both intoxicated and in no condition to drive, and he seemed aware of that. Take care, Sonny, he said when we reached my cabin and I got off. If you ever need anything, you know where to find me. Will do, I assured him and went inside. I went to bed for the night, and I soon fell asleep, helped by the alcohol in my blood. The next day, I cooked the stew I so desperately craved and heard a knock on the door as I dashed around the stove. Huck came to visit, with him another six-pack of beer and a warm hug after I opened the door for him. Sit down, I said, pointing at the table. Food's almost ready. Thanks, Sonny, he said, pulling out a chair and throwing himself in it. I fetched another bowl and a set of cutlery for him. We cracked open the beers and talked some more as we waited for the stew. I come out here every weekend, Hug said. I live nearby, so I'll be gone Sunday evening, but I'll be back next Friday. Take care while I'm away, okay? I will, I said, sensing worry in his voice. I'll follow the rules, don't worry. Hug said with a soft smile that pulled his scarred lips upwards. You should check on that stew, by the way. I did, as I was told, and found that the stew was ready to be served. We ate a bowl each and I even went back for seconds. It turned out delicious. I never expected wild meat to be such a big step up from the store-bought. 
After a few more beers, Huck got up and left, saying that he wanted to get in one more hunt for the weekend. He wanted me to join him, but seeing as I only had a bow and he wanted to bag something bigger than a rabbit, I turned him down. Bring the right tool for the job or something, right? I said. Yup, Huck answered with a smile and patted my shoulder. You'll do just fine, I'm sure of it. With that, Huck left to do his own thing. I spent the day lazing about, catching up on some reading and being all around unproductive, but with the cabin sorted out and enough meat in my freezer to last me for a few days, I didn't have anything to do. I won't bore you with what I did after that, since it was pretty much more of the same thing. Huck left Sunday evening, just like he said he would, leaving me all alone. But I appreciated the solitude, and I had a blast doing whatever I wanted on the property. Despite my promise, I didn't follow Huck's seemingly crazy warnings. I saw no point in most of them to be honest. I also didn't do much hunting anyway, opting for fishing most days for an easier source of meat. And on the few occasions that I did hunt again, I went for small prey that I could either trap or kill with a bow. So, mostly squirrels and rabbits. Huck did return the next weekend, and he came to visit first thing Sunday morning. He brought me some more beer, which I was thankful for, since I didn't bring any. I've seen sons of hogs on the far side of my property, he said, and I brought an extra rifle for you if you want to join me. I'll split the catch with you, of course. Sure, why not, I said, and just like that, I signed myself up. We went out, and this time I was better prepared. I brought my own hunting knife and took my bow with me, despite the rifle Huck had given me. We ended up finding the hogs, a feat which Huck attributed to Yanser once again. We shot a couple of them dead before the rest scrambled, and he did his ritual. I stood a little ways away, on guard in case any of the other hogs returned to attack us. I had a sound far away from me, so I turned as I raised and aimed the rifle. But when I looked through the scope, all I saw was a deer. My tense body unwound and I aimed the rifle down as I took my finger off the trigger. Huck heard the commotion I made, so he shot up to his feet and noticed the deer as well. Their eyes met for a few moments and Huck nodded his head at it. The deer took off into the forest and he got back down on his hunches to finish bearing the hearts. So many deer in these parts. I said when he was done. What? Huck asked, taken aback. I've seen a lot of them around. They don't seem scared of me. That's like the fifth or sixth one. Hearing that, Huck frowned. He rubbed his bloody hands on his jeans to clean them and approached me. Did you hunt while I was gone? He asked, and I could tell that he wasn't messing around. Yeah, I answered honestly. Some squirrels and rabbits. And did you return their spirits to the answer like I taught you? I did. I lied to his face, but it was enough to set him at ease. Good, he said. It's probably just curious about you. You're a new arrival after all. Without another word, Huck left to retrieve the four-wheeler. The hogs were too heavy for us to carry by ourselves. I stayed behind to guard them from foragers, and Huck was hasty with his return. We tied them to the vehicle and went back, with Hook promising to bring me my share of the meat when he was done butchering it. Take the rifle back too, I said before we parted at the halfway point. Keep it, maybe you'll need it, Hook said, and his gesture of kindness surprised me. Nah, I said, I don't want to risk breaking it or something. Hook gave in and took the rifle from my hands. See you tomorrow, neighbor. See ya. It was nearing sundown by the time I got back on my property, so I picked up the pace to make it home in time. There wasn't anything dangerous out in the forest as far as I knew. No wolves or bears or anything, but I didn't feel safe in the darkness of the night. I was maybe 20 minutes away when the sun touched the horizon, draping the world in shadows of bloody red. My senses sharpened as my alertness reached this peak, and I looked every which way as I walked. I usually wasn't so paranoid, but I guess that Hook's constant yapping about this Yanza spirit really got to me. Anyway, I found one of the paths that cut through the forest and led back to the cabin, so I followed it. I was only about a mile away 
so I still had a little ways to go. But something stopped me dead in my tracks. Another damn deer veered in from the forest behind me, halting in the middle of the path and freezing like a statue when it noticed me. It gave me a good scare for a moment, but my fear soon turned to admiration. This particular specimen was a buck, and the most damn beautiful one I'd ever laid eyes on. Its fur all but glistened in the sun's fading rays. Its big round eyes pierced my soul, and its antlers were tall spires of an unmatched elegance. I made no sudden moves, but the buck wasn't scared of me anyway. The moment I saw it, I was so taken aback by its beauty that I just knew I had to have it, cliché as that might sound. I could already imagine the trophy, a centerpiece that would take up any room. The only problem was how to kill the buck, since I only had my bow with me. Screw it, I decided. I can take the shot. I slowly pulled the bow up and over my head, and I retrieved an arrow from the quiver. The buck didn't try to run, so I notched the arrow and took aim, hoping to hit it square in the neck. A deep sense of anxiety invaded me as I pulled the arrow back, as if what I was about to do was absolute sacrilege, but I didn't falter. I let the arrow fly. The buck tried to turn and run away at the last moment, but it was too late. The arrow clipped it in the lower jaw, and I saw it spit out parts of its tongue, mixed with blood and broken teeth. Regret instantly flooded me, and I took off after it, pulling out my hunting knife to hopefully give it a quick end, but the buck took off. Realising that I couldn't catch up to it, I tried to pull out another arrow, but I wasn't fast enough. In a matter of moments, it got away, and the prospect of the night creeping up on me kept me from following it. I couldn't track it through the dark, and I'd end up lost in the forest. So, I put the bow away and kept walking back to the cabin, feeling terrible the whole way. Not for what I tried, but for failing. By the time I reached it, night had already settled, so I hurried inside and turned on all the lights. I was still spooked, but I figured it was just Huck's stories rubbing me the wrong way. Nothing that a tasty dinner and some sleep couldn't fix, or so I hoped. I had a bit of trouble falling asleep that night, but I managed to after a while. I don't know how late it was when I was awoken by a loud bang coming from the other side of the cabin. All I knew was that it was the middle of the night and it was dark as balls outside. Another bang came, louder than the one before it as it echoed through the cabin, so I jumped to my feet. I didn't get to dress up as the banging continued and was soon accompanied by scraping sounds as well. I retrieved the bow and the hunting knife, which, yeah, it offered me little in the means of protection if I faced some predator, but it was better than snooping around empty-handed. The banging kept coming, and I pinpointed it to the guest room. I opened the door slowly to check out the situation outside through the window, but I didn't need to approach it. The sight I was met with left me paralyzed in fear. Outside, crashing headfirst into the cabin's sturdy walls repeatedly, was a deer. One much bigger than it had any right to be, with crooked antlers bent and broken at awkward angles. Seeing me, it charged at the window, sending shards of glass flying into the room and breaking me free from my stupor. I yelled, but that only angered the deer. It pushed its head into the room, breaking the window's frame and cutting itself as it tried to reach me. I didn't stick around. I turned and bolted down the corridor in a terror-fueled sprint. I didn't know where to, but it didn't matter so long as I got away from it. I tried to reach the front door, but the deer figured me out. By the time I got there, it was already headbutting it, and even if I reached it, what then? I couldn't outrun it on foot. I needed wheels, and I needed to find help. So I changed direction and ran to the bedroom, fishing the four-wheeler's keys out of my pants. It was just beyond the cabin, so I opened the window and jumped out. The deer quickly followed me around the cabin, finding me the moment my feet hit the grassy ground outside. In the moon's washed out light, I got a better look at it. My initial assessment was horribly wrong. It was so much bigger than I thought. Bigger than a damn moose, and much more imposing. But the thing that froze the blood in my veins, its fur was dishevelled, 
revealing rotting flesh and exposed bone beneath. Its eyes were shiny and clouded by white swirls, and I felt its gaze push me into overdrive when it landed on me. It charged at me, and I dodged its slam in the nick of time. I heard it collide with the cabin, sending the whole structure rocking back and forth, but I didn't stop to look back. I bolted towards the four-wheeler and jumped on it, my hands trembling like an earthquake as I tried to get the keys into ignition. The engine roared to life beneath me, so I floored it through the clearing. The deer came at me from the side, but I hit the brakes hard and watched it fly in front of me. Before it regained its bearings, I took off towards the trees, hoping it would have trouble following me. It did to some degree, but I couldn't outright lose it. I saw its shadow in the forest as I navigated the bumpy terrain, and whenever I reached the more clear part of the woods, it tried to charge me again, but I kept constant track of it, so it didn't manage to get me. My destination was Huck's cabin, the closest human and the only one with proper guns. The drive up to his clearing was utter madness. I don't think I let up the acceleration for even a second. In retrospect, I'm surprised I didn't crash into a tree or a ditch or something, but in that moment, I didn't think straight. I was pumped so full of adrenaline and terror that I disregarded all consequences. My only goal was to escape the demonic deer following me. Huck! I started yelling the moment I burst into his clearing. Huck, help! Turning my head around, I saw that the deer paused by the forest edge, breaking the pursuit. Huck shot out of his cabin, dressed in only boxes and shouldering one of his rifles. I stopped in front of his porch and jumped off the four-wheeler, running up to him as I panted heavily. What's up, Sonny? He asked, not tearing his gaze from the forest. It's a damn demon deer! I yelled in answer. It's trying to kill me! What the hell did you do? Hug scolded. As if on cue, the deer left the cover of the trees, making itself known. That's the answer. What in the ever-loving hell did you do, you stupid kid? I couldn't answer. Couldn't even move when I laid eyes on it again. The answer had grown bigger than before, towering over us, about the size of Hook's cabin at this point. I'm sorry, I blurted. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I heard the rifle clatter as it hit the ground, and looked up to find that Hook dropped it from his hands. He kneeled in front of me and grabbed my shoulders, and I could see pure terror in his eyes. They'd grown watery as tears escaped him, but even so, he retained more self-control than me. It's fine, Sonny. Huck tried to calm me down. You'll be fine, don't worry. But, I tried to protest, but Huck wouldn't hear any of it. I said, you'll be fine. Believe me, okay? With the answer approaching us slowly, I had no other alternative than to believe him and pray that he was right. He forced my head back down, so low that my forehead touched the ground. But, he got back up to his feet. I took short, scared glances at what was going on, but I was too afraid to do anything. Huck walked towards me, and it stopped when it saw him approach. Forgive him, Huck yelled. He's young, he didn't know what he was doing. Hearing his words, the answer paused. It lowered his head until its undead eyes were at Huck's level, but I could see the distrust in them, even from this far away. Give his punishment to me, Huck yelled. It's my fault for not teaching him better, and I'll make sure he won't repeat his mistake ever again. Huck, I yelled. You can't. Shut up, Huck yelled over his shoulder, but I didn't have the guts to look him in the eye. The answer walked up to him, and I saw him get down on his knees in front of it. I couldn't hold back anymore. I started crying. If the answer would have repaid my deed in kind, he would have mutilated Huck. The image of the deer's lower jaw pierced and ruined by my arrow flashed through my mind, followed by Huck bearing the same ugly injury, and it was too much for me to take. Huck lifted his head to look at it, and I saw one of Yanza's antlers droop lower until one of its many jaded tips rested against his jaw. But he didn't pull back. Hell, he didn't even flinch. No, I yelled, which made Yanza stop and look up at me. Shut. Hug began, but I stopped him. I was the one who did it, not him. You can't punish him for my mistake. Hug turned and looked at me, with desperation in his eyes. 
but I already decided not to let him go through with it, and I guess that Yansa saw the conviction in my eyes. He pushed Hook aside with his rotten snout and walked around him, stopping in front of me instead. The stench of his decay hit me hard, nearly sending me reeling when it invaded my senses. It was such an ugly and twisted being, and yet I couldn't feel a single trace of malice coming from it. No, the answer didn't want to bring me unwarranted suffering. He wanted justice. I'm sorry, I said, lowering my head to the ground once more. I really, truly am. I know I broke a trust and I deserve your punishment, but I'm sorry. A puff of putrid air left Yance's nostrils, rolling over my features and nearly making me gag. I felt his head maneuver until its snout caressed my hair, and I tensed up as I got ready for what I thought would follow. My eyes closed shut, so tight that they pulled my face into a grimace. But the blow never came. Instead, I felt something sticky and slick probe the ground until it found my right hand. Yance's tongue enveloped my fingers, pulling them up, and I felt his jagged teeth nibble at my flesh. With a sickening crunch that sent bolts of pain radiating through my body, it bit my index finger off and swallowed it. I yelled out in pain, feeling blood welling from the wound, but Yance didn't let me pull back. It got a grip on my hand and bit off my middle finger as well. The pain was so horrendous that I nearly passed out, but I somehow managed to remain conscious. I feared that it would go for another bite, that it would take my hand little by little as punishment, but it stopped at those two fingers and let me go. It got up and turned its back on me, shrinking as it retreated into the woods, until it was the size of a normal deer. I saw it look back at me one final time. Not a single trace of the ugly monster that had chased me remained. Huck rushed to my side after Yansa left, pulling me to my feet and helping me inside his cabin. He busted out a first aid kit and did his best to patch me up before driving me to the closest town so a medic could have a proper look at it. I needed a lot of stitches, and the doctor also gave me a rabies vaccine just to be safe. As morning came and my condition was stable, the doctor released me. You got very lucky, Hug told me on the way back after I told him what I'd done to warrant Yance's wrath. Seeing his scarred face, finally understanding what had happened to him, I didn't find the statement hard to believe. Thank you, I said, for what you tried to do back there. Hook took me back to my cabin, but he kept an eye on me for as long as he could. He left Sunday evening like he was supposed to, and despite his insistence that I should leave too, I stayed. I couldn't explain it to him back then, and I still can't put into words to this day. But I'm not afraid of Yansa or the forest. If anything, I've gained a deeper understanding and appreciation for it. Me and Huck are still friends to this day, by the way. I go out there whenever I can now, and we've been on countless hunts together. The least he deserves out of the ordeal is a friend. But the one thing that did change is how I now respect Yansa, and no matter where you are, I urge you to respect it as well. Believe me, you don't want to risk earning the answer's wrath.